But if it's worth it to you, it'll be worth it when it it becomes successful. I think I just heard the phone call. That's what I was looking for. Yeah, man, we got somebody at the door, so let's find out who's here. Um, Welcome to Straight Talk with Data Bart. You are on the line. Could you tell us who we have the pleasure of speaking with tonight? Hello? 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 Hey. Hello. Hey. It's is this Monet? Monet? It is. How are you doing, Monet? I was looking forward to hearing from Monet. This is Monet Noel Marshall. She is a powerful <laughs> activist out of the theater world and out of the entertainment world. I'm just amazed at some of the things that she does because she doesn't hold back any punches. She's one of those people that, you know, recognizes that a lot of times our people in the arts don't get recognized because of for what they are about. You know, people try to get them to do stuff for free and do things of that nature. She actually made whole plays about it. She's like, look, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to also expose y'all. So I just want her to talk a little bit about how she got into theater and about some of these powerful plays that she's done because I've always seen her to do stuff that addresses a lot of issues, one of them being how we do not support our artists the way that we should. And I love the titles of a lot of your plays. So if you'll just share with our audience a little bit about how you got into theater and what what your whole mission is. Absolutely. First, thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. So um, I am really a theater kid in the most honest way. I get it from my mama. She is a theater artist. Um, she's a playwright and a director and a choreographer, and my first lessons were from her. And then beyond that, I'm also a proud Aggie alum, I got a degree in theater and acting specifically um, from North Carolina A&T State University. And that is really what cemented my time here in North Carolina. My mama is from, a, from Greenville, North Carolina, and my dad's from New York, and I was raised in New York. So once I came down, I kind of fell in love with North Carolina and have been in the area ever since. Um, the work that I create, I consider myself a a social practice artist, which means that I want to create performances and opportunities for folks to be in relationship with one another and with themselves. So, and I do that through interactive and immersive theater. So, theater where you can interact, where you're asked to do things, where you can make choices, where you can change things. It's, it's, I'm not as interested in folks coming and just sitting in the seat and watching a play. I want them to know they are part of the world and part of the experience. Um, because that's how we live our lives. We don't get to just sit and let something happen in front of us. Like everything that we experience, we shift it. Uh, last year, I created a trilogy of work called the Buy It, Call It trilogy. And the first piece I think that um, Mark was mentioning called Buy My Soul and Call It Art. And it really it, it dug into the ways that black people, black art, black bodies are tr- used and misused in mainstream white art institutions. Um, And it's something that I've come in contact with in lots of different ways and was tired of being invited to be like the angry black woman woman that would challenge white folks at events without actually making art about it. So that's what I did. And what were some of the most important lessons that you learned from that play? Like I said, when I've talked to people that have seen that play, they often even talk about how it made them... um, analyze and rethink and reconceptualize what art meant to them and how they were actually treating some of their fellow peers. So I imagine you've heard some of that conversations as well where people might have been actually getting involved in those kinds of things but not realizing that they were doing that and it might have even made them change some of their attitudes or find ways to actually address some of what are the injustices that they create in some cases. So I was just wondering what are some of the examples that you might give of that you have heard of people that have told you that they have seen the play and it made them rethink what was going on. Absolutely. Um, I think one of the major pieces about the play is that um, folks before the play starts, at the very beginning, they're given some fake money to spend, quote, unquote, spend wisely throughout the installation. And we really are trying to, quote, unquote, spend our money wisely, and especially when it comes to art and thinking about, well, who do I want to support? How do I want to support them? As if, and 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 then it makes it seem like 
art and the way that we spend our dollars is not still connected to racism or sexism and, and patriarchy and all of these things when it is, even in the art world. Like, there is no place in our society where it hasn't been touched by these systems. And, but sometimes we act like art is infallible and liberal and everyone just has the best intentions and no one's getting hurt. That's not true. So some of the things that surprised folks is, like, how, you know, this fake money, they created a relationship with it off, like, as soon as it started, and they were spending it like it, it meant something, you know, and how that changed the way that they would interact with performers and with other people. So, for instance, there was a scene where they are asked to sell. They, so early in the play, they got some ideas, some, some free ideas that were stolen by some white folks from a black woman sitting on a couch. So they, the white folks would write down her ideas unbeknownst to her and give them out to the audience. It's like, oh, you should keep this idea, hold on to this. And then later, there was someone who came and asked, like, hey, I heard you have got some ideas. You selling ideas? I'm, telling, I'm in the market to buy ideas. And now they are selling these same ideas they just got for free from a black woman. And, like, how many folks were like, oh, who were selling them? and not thinking about her. Some folks, you know, would give her uh, her idea back with some money, like would go back to that installation without any prompting. Um, and some people were like, like my brother, for instance, he didn't spend any money the whole time. He was like, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't, I don't know. Maybe I could win something if I had the most money in the end. But no one gave that instruction. So it becomes capitalism where you could just, like, just get as much as you can and, like, take care of yourself. And so that was a, a huge learning about the ways that we are trained around money and art. Because I know one of the things that I know a lot of artists, my dad is an artist, he's a visual artist, uh, photographer, and does other things as well. But I know, and having conversations with him and having conversations even with, like, Monica Burns, who's been on this show before, and with other folks, there's oftentimes people that want to get the art, and I know you mentioned this in a couple of the plays that you've done as well, they want to get the art for free. Like, they want you to perform, they want mm. you to do the art, and they don't necessarily understand the nature and how beneficial the arts are. Now, we know that art, in, as a historical thing, has helped us with education. It helps us with um, understanding our um, being more well-rounded in education. But then you have some people that are, when they talk to artists, they almost treat the artists as if they're um, suspect and they're not really doing anything that is worthwhile. But they're just, it's like they feel like it's a hobby. And some of these people are well-established artists. I've even had the conversation before he passed with Baba Chuck, and he would even talk about how sometimes people would not necessarily respect his art as well, and he was like a world-renowned dancer and everything. So I think that sometimes we treat the artists almost as if they're a um, subset of culture and that they don't deserve to get the same kind of rewards that, say, a doctor does or a plumber does, even though they are giving us a lot of very valuable things in our life, not just the... Um, beauty of the art, but also a lot of times the art is making powerful statements about what's going on in our world. And, I mean, whether it's uh, something that's powerful as Hamilton or whether it's something that's maybe not as well known, there's been a lot of art that touches on issues of all sorts within our community, whether it's rural living, city living, or whatever. And I don't know that we necessarily give the artists the kind of respect they deserve. So as a young artist, I was wanting to know what you thought of those kind of statements and whether you've run across that as well. Oh, absolutely. I think that was one of the reasons I wanted to do this whole body of work. And, I, and one of the reasons I do the organizing and working with other artists that I do and, you know, because local government or local businesses, because art is so essential to the way that we live our lives. Like it's, it's so essential that we actually don't know a day without art. Like any color that we wear on our clothing, when we put on, when we choose one outfit over another, any adornment, the colors of our car, like, art impacts all of it, every single thing. And, but I think because often artists are creating something that is beyond value, that, like, how do you value a color? You know, like, for, you know, how, how do you value the song that, like, changed your mood? Like, how do you actually value that? And I think we actually don't have a practice in in actual value, we have a practice in capitalism. So right. if you, if I'm trying to sell, I'm, if I'm actually trying to invite you into an experience as opposed to sell you a product, then how do I, how do I price that? Because this, like, this is an invitation into your own humanity. 
what number would I put on that, really? And I think when I talk to a lot of artists, it's like, look, I actually, and I know I have experienced art, that I'm like, that was worth more money than I have or worth more money than I know um, because it changed something inside of me. And for artists, it's like, look, I really believe that art is, there's no, no dollar amount that one can put on art. So let's just make sure that artists are living well. <laughs> like, if, if we can just say, like, okay, but it, we're just so used to being able to put a number on everything that it makes us really uncomfortable when we can't. Yeah, that's um, very true. Yeah. And I was just wondering, now, one of the other conversations that I know that's happened in the art community, and I imagine you've been part of this as well, is that sometimes, and some of these people are actually artists themselves, but I know that sometimes it seems as if some of our art administrators, even though some of them come out of the art world, don't necessarily want to give the artists respect as much as they should also, because I know a lot of times you'll find art administrators that are wanting the artists the artists to come to their venues, their festivals, their whatever, but then they don't necessarily want to give them the kind of rewards that they deserve, or they want to pay them what amounts to pennies on the dollars, and or and claim that you know they love using that word that it's going to give them great exposure, even though you know you can't live mm-hmm. off of exposure. So I know even sometimes you find artists that are running major festivals, might be in Raleigh, might be in Durham, or even in some of the big cities, and they'll swear up and down that, you know, you should do this work because it's going to give you this great exposure. And I'm not saying that exposure isn't important, but I was just wondering how you dealt with administrators that you feel might not be respecting the artist as much as they should be. Yeah. So uh, this is a really interesting conversation because um, because of my job, I'm the director of programming at VAE Raleigh at downtown Raleigh. So because of this, I'm on both sides of this conversation. I'm an artist that gets called to do things, or um, but I'm also an administrator that programs and is looking at my budget and saying, like, oh, I have $300 to offer you for this, or I have $200 to offer you for this. So as an artist, I think for me, I have to create my own metric of what I'm going to say yes and no to. And that has been really important and really helpful and in community, as a community of artists, locally and regionally, to have conversation around what we're going to, what we're going to do or not do. And it almost feels like unionizing in a weird way um, because it's like, look, if a call, a call for work comes out and we know that if the amount offered is disrespectful to a professional artist, then if real professional artists don't apply. Because then they're like, oh, I can, can't do that again. If they're, oh, if you really wanted professional art, but they're just going to get artwork from, you know, high school students. And a lot of high school students, they also have fantastic work and fantastic art, but they're right. not, you know, trying to make a living or on, on whatever that that is that moment. So if that's the if that's what they want, cool, fine. But if you want professional artists to submit to something, you need to offer a professional professional artist rate. So right. that's one solidarity among artists and say for us to decide individually and collectively what we're going to say yes to and what we're not going to say yes to. As yeah, an administrator... Yeah, go ahead. As an administrator? I was going to say, as an administrator, though, I, I do understand, and I want artists to know their own budget and their own number for how much they value and charge for their time because, like, you know, arts organizations often talk about what they have and what they don't have, and it's true. Like, I'm going to get a budget from my boss. He's going to tell me how much money I have for a program, and then I need to figure it out from there. And if artists, even artists who I, you know, tea tea with and have tea and tea and dinner with, if they're like, Ashley Lone, I can't afford to do that at that rate, I respect that. Please tell me that so that I can, one, advocate for more money, and two, so that you're not doing something that's against your morals and ethics and um, it's actually going to have you um, misrepresenting and, mis- and devaluing your art practice. So yeah, cause I, I think that's a, that's a major part of it. I mean. Yeah, because I know another thing that happens sometimes is that you find, um, I mean, we all love the national artists, we all love the world-renowned artists, but I know that there have been conversations even here with some of the public art where sometimes people feel that the artists that are from another place and I know this is the standard stereotype that you're oftentimes respected elsewhere before you're respected at home. But sometimes I know that there are some local artists that sometimes feel that they don't get enough, that they're not asked 
and the people that are out there in the community will go ask somebody that's a world-renowned artist. So they'll make a call for an art and focus on the world-renowned one, even though there are people that are doing similar side work that are right here locally. And I'm just wondering if you think that that's a legitimate complaint and how you...